Welcome to the third episode of Sea Nature. Today we have a packed program, many of our regular features, but also some new ones to look forward to. We start by looking to see where people are, and I would invite you to just mark on this map uh, where you are at the moment. So I can see quite a few people as we would expect in the Cheshire Chester around the Manchester area. Uh, we've somebody up between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, somebody up, um, looks like Darlington there. Uh, up towards the top part of Lancashire, Yorkshire, I can see. Um, East Anglia, Mark, a couple of people down on the coast. Uh, just north of the, is that the Essex coach that I see there? Um, somebody down in the Cotswolds, and people from Wales and Almo. Um, Almo is not able to be included here uh, because he's actually joining us from Italy and we don't have Italy on our map. So welcome everybody and I expect with this uh, range of locations uh, that we've got quite varied experiences in terms of our uh, observations for of nature over the last week. But before we come to that, and whilst you're thinking of what your highlights for this last week have been, uh, our quiz for the week is to see uh, is to ask you what you think this uh, species might be. You might want to put some um, comments, uh, some answers into the comment button or you might want to wait and hold on to your thoughts until we come towards the end. Ella thinks it's a type of orchid, that's um, a pretty good start. Luke's saying the bee orchid, but a question mark, exclamation mark, and then a question mark. So it's gone from being absolutely certain to being a bit unsure about it. Oh, a few other people thinking it's a bee orchid as well. Well, we'll come back to that later. Now, I asked you to think about what your highlight of the week has been in terms of what you have seen. Well, I'm going to start, but not by sharing my thoughts on what I've seen over the last week, but actually what I heard. And it was on my walk this morning and there's a little bit of wind blowing in my local area today that leaves our being moved uh, by this breeze and at one point I was struck by the contrasting sounds that the leaves on the various trees were making and in particular the difference in sound as the wind blew through some weeping willow and then soon afterwards I passed some aspen trees and those of you that know the aspen will know that it rattles and rattles and rattles. And so for me, the observation of the week is really this difference in sound that we get, not just what we see, but what we hear. I wonder, uh, is um, there anybody that would like to share with us your highlight of the week? Uh, Fiona, I can see Fiona raised a hand. Would you like to say what your um, highlight is, Fiona? Yes, hello everyone. Um, we're in very rural North Norfolk. There's very little traffic here. And it was an absolute joy yesterday, but it was quite interesting because there was constant drizzle, but there was a song thrush singing its heart out, which I did actually record, although I can't share it with you right now. But what was interesting to me, it was, in, it was actually in the drizzle and it, it sang almost nonstop for 30 minutes. Um, which is a wonderful sound, but I was surprised that it was doing it in that weather. Yes, I don't know if anybody else has seen, uh, experienced this um, uh, this idea of song thrushes singing. I know, um, is it the missile thrush that's uh, the, the storm cock that sits at the top of the tree and sings just before? Well, maybe, maybe then it was a missile thrush, Philip. That, that, that might be the, the, the logical answer, yes. Mm. 
Um, Hugh, I see you've raised your hand. Would you like to? Um, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, observation. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I was on a walk the other day. It was quite quite eve a late late evening, and uh, saw a couple of juvenile kestrels that had been in a bird box that I'd never noticed before, and uh, I just managed to get incredibly close to them before they uh, hid away and flew off to another tree and and uh, themselves in there and then the mother came and, and brought on mice for them and it was it was quite a treat to watch them be fed this mice these little jewels the, these little jewels of yeah. observations are so important to us thank you for sharing sure. that you steve i see you've raised your hand is that because you also have a, an observation to share with us Steve's not talking to us, not answering. Eleanor, you've also raised your hand. Is that because you have an observation? Yeah, it's unfortunately not as exciting as baby kestrels, but it was behaviour I'd never seen before. And um, so, so that means it's exciting because it's yeah. all, when we see anything new, it's that frisson of excitement. Yes, but it was shown on Spring Watch the day after. <laughs> So it was um, it was just um, the wasps gathering wood. Oh yes. And yeah, I, kind of, I wanted to ask: Is it just the queen wasps which gather wood, or is Steve, it? Steve, you're our entomologist. Steve, I think it's all it's all kinds of wasps because I've seen workers doing it. Okay, um, they were quite large, but um, it was um, just after some rain as well, which was really interesting. But it was the noise as well, you could actually hear them sort of scream. It was brilliant. Queens would definitely do it as well, but I don't okay. think she could ever gather enough for a whole nest. No, uh, there were quite a few. Queens, sorry to interrupt. Do the queens actually come out from the nest during the year? And once they've gone in, once they've created those first initial brood cells, do they then leave again? If not, they will stay in the nest and it'll have to be the workers that expand the nest by collecting more wood. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And um, they're very different in size. Yeah, but that is a fantastic observation. It's always good to see these things that then appear on television as well. Yeah, a yeah. film as well, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else got anything that they'd like to share with us today? Just wanted to say I went to the Wirral and um, on the high tide there were some some wonderful, sorry my video is not on, wonderful um, ring plovers and dunlin and a few other waders um, and I managed to dodge between the, the, the dog walkers and get some nice pictures um, and there's also a dead porpoise which seemed to be attracting the dogs quite a lot. Yeah, but it's good to see that, well, it's dead, but um, it's good to see that there are porpoises um, off the Wirral now, because for many years they weren't, the water was too polluted. Uh, that's but, a good sign that things are improving. But the waders were great. Yes. Right, we're going to move on. And this is a choice. Um, I have two uh, possible webcams for you to look at. Uh, one of them is of some turns and the other is of puffins. If you'd like to watch a webcam on turns, can you press the red button? If you'd like to see puffins, can you press the green button? button. At the moment, it's two each. Two each. Three, the three. it's three each, four each. And it is fairly evenly matched. So we're going to watch both of them. I can't separate between there. There wasn't a clear um, a clear winner. So the first one that I'm sending you through now, um, if you click on that link, and then I'll just give you a minute to watch that particular link.
and I'm now sending you the other link. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, a little view outside and a uh, little further afield. I don't know if anybody's got any, well, has anybody any comments I'd like to make about either of those two uh, webcams? Uh, Steve's saying that the puffins are definitely the most photogenic today. Oh yes, and the turn chicks, uh, Fiona, yes, they um, you know, can see them underneath the, the adults. Anybody else wish to share an observation about either of these two webcams? Uh, roof over there, Ness Costa. Yes. And Eleanor wasn't aware that the terns nested so close to the water's edge. Yes, they do. Um, you, uh, many of the term colonies are uh, right on the, the strand line and uh, can be uh, affected by high tides. And the puffins look to be nest building. Well, the, the puffins will nest underground. Uh, if they carry any material in, they'll go under uh, into old, or into holes that they've created. Well, I hope you enjoyed those two webcams. And we pass now on to Greg. Over to you, Greg. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me, yeah? Yep, can hear you, and I stopped sharing, so you should be able to share your video. Okay. Um, yeah, so obviously uh, this week's been cool and we've seen quite a lot of rain. Um, so the expected number of new for garden moths or new for year moths was uh, a little bit lower. Um, haven't had so, so many nights with high catch rates. However, I still have had a, a couple of new ones for the garden. So uh, to start with is a common wainscot, which is sort of this nice uh, sort of dull, dullish looking moth. Um, I've had about two of them this week. Uh, I did have one a couple of weeks ago, but that was outside the trap. So I didn't get quite a good photo of it, but this one actually managed to go in. Um, and this is quite a nice one. This is a yellow shell, which is actually a day flying moth. Um, you can often see it out on your walks around hedgerows and um, sort of brambles and blackthorn and stuff like that. It's quite an easy moth to see, even on grassland. Um, so I was quite surprised to get that in the trap. Um, and of course, uh, got another elephant, had about four the other night when it was really warm. Um, I guess maybe there's some plants in my garden which attract them. I, I'm not sure why I get so many. Uh, and a buff ermine as well, which has been a regular sort of occurrence in my trap. Um, and then there's this one, which uh, has been pro providing a bit of trouble because it's there's a few species that it could be, um, but I think it's an uncertain because um, it could also have been a rustic shoulder knot or possibly even a large nutmeg. But I believe this is an uncertain. Uh, judging by photos other people have posted. Um, also, uh, another, this one was new for the garden. This is a shoulder striped wainscot. So it's a bit like the common wainscot, but it's got these much more marked, uh, varied markings, including this sort of long stripe down the shoulder on either side of the wing. Uh, so that was a nice new one for the garden uh, on a sort of not very productive night. 
And then the other night, it was very warm. So we had about, about 10 degrees, and this is a treble brown spot. I think that's his name, if I remember correctly. Um, and a small Phoenix, Geometrid, didn't go in the trap, but uh, it uh, hovered around my conservatory for a while. Um, and also, I got a very spectacular Geometrid called a Swallowtail. Now, this is a picture from last last year, but um, this one sort of hung around, they fly around the trap. Um, they never usually go in, or not at least my style of trap, which is a heath. Um, but they're really quite big, smart looking moths. And if you can get one to land near or close by to the trap, it's worth having a look at them um, because they are quite f fascinating to look at. Uh, I also had this very fresh poplar hawk moth, which was so fresh it almost had a purple sheen to it. The photo doesn't really sort of do justice, but I think um, it was amazing. I've, I've never seen one quite so purplish before. Um, I assume it's just. It, obviously came out either that day or the day before um so that was quite a good night because i also had privet hawk moth as well and small elephant so four species um and here's a couple of mac micros haven't quite identified them yet obviously they're quite tiny um but there's a sort of nice big variety um there and this is sort of what I'm dealing, what I had to deal with that night. So this is quite a busy scene for my moth trap, and this was sort of what every carton looked like. So we've got a pair of dark arches, another uncertain heart and club, and the rest are all heart and darts, which are still dominating the trap at the moment. But I'm expecting the dark arches to start um, increasing and taking over. Um, however, last night, despite it being quite uh, cool and windy. I did get a bit of a surprise on the wall, which is a lobster moth, which in Gloucestershire is more common around the Forest of Dean, as it's more of a woodland species. But this was a really nice find uh, on the wall. It hung around in, and was still there in the morning uh, until it flew off, I guess, when it came a bit too light. But this is a new one for me. I've never seen one before. Um, and so I was quite happy to get this. Um, but also, I found a, a couple of new things on the internet. So. This is a really good website called What's Flying Tonight. And basically what it does is it looks at your grid reference and provides you on the date that you look the 50 most common moths in your area. Um, but you can also change it to uh, top 100 species. And also you can change the date. So if I went for August the 11th in my area, you can see there's a sort of different change in the species. What's the most dominant? So the yellow underwings are um, you can also change the location so i could do salford um so it's common in salford in august the 11th it's a really good website and it's quite interesting because it also helps out with a bit of moth identification because it provides you the most common chances um so this is all sort of salford's most common species so good numbers of ruby tiger for one example uh salad kitten as well um so quite a, quite a good variation quite a good website uh, i think it's just based on records people have uh submitted um so this was another mic mic micro moth i got the other day um it flew off unfortunately but it's a really striking one called uh, alabonia jeffrella um i don't really pay much attention to the micros because they're so small but i try and get pictures when i can because they're so easily quick to fly off um, but this one really caught my eye. Um, for, for, unfortunately, flew off before I could get a proper picture, but I think I probably wouldn't be able to see it as well as some of these ones. Um, and also, recently, uh, my place did a video on Facebook uh, of sort of emptying a moth trap. Yes, sure, I could put the website. Um, here we go. So also this week, of course, because with the weather, I've been hunting orchids instead of sort of butterflies and stuff, which rely on sort of good weather. So I went to a good spot and found quite a few different species. So this is a common spotted, a boldly marked one, um, a hybrid southern marsh in common spotted, uh, which you can tell you can tell from a purebred southern marsh because the leaves don't have the spots that. Or the rosettes don't have the spots that the common spotted do. Uh, this is a really nice sort of hybrid. And again, another example. I think this might be, yeah, 
another example. So these common spotted have the sort of raspberry ripple effect of the common spotted, but the sort of uh, orchid structure of southern marsh. Um, bee orchids are in good number, and also an unusual variation of the bee orchid, a bit of a subspecies, which is a wasp orchid. Um, so you can see this structure here is much more um, elongated. Um, it has not rolled up. So compared to the bee orchid, it's quite a different structure to the wasp orchid. Um, and again, this is, I think this is a purebred southern marsh. Um, so it hasn't got any spots in the leaves down here. Um, if it was a hybrid of common spots, it would have purple spots all over the rosettes. Um, and this is sort of the idea of what I had to deal with. This is just a small section of this wildflower meadow, and it's quite big. And this entire expanse was just full of common spotted orchids. It was incredible to see. And this was the one I was really looking for, which is a burnt tip orchid. Uh, they're really rare, just sort of local to a couple of downland sites and chalk sites across the south of the country. I think you do get them up north in a few certain areas, but they're super hard to find, as you can tell. So it's a really small size, but I found quite a few in good condition. Um, they look a bit similar to another orchid called a lady orchid with these sort of petals here, which are shaped like a are they sort of traditional lady sort of costume from, I don't know, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but I did find a really good, nice cluster of them. And you can see why they're called burnt tips with the dark flowers at the top, uh, followed by the other flowers at the bottom. Um, so that was a really nice find. I'd not, not an orchid I'd ever seen before. Um, and I had to scour the hay meadow to find them. But luckily, this cluster was quite visible. Um, and a pyramidal orchid as well, which was this one was probably the best one I saw that day. Um, properly doing the pyramidal shape and uh, also out were marble whites which was new for the year um, so uh, they'll be sort of dominating the grasslands now up on my local patch um, last year was a particularly big bloom for them I think I don't know how big they'll be this year but with the droughts and everything but yeah they should be becoming really common everywhere across the country and I also had a trip to the forest of Dean uh, where I found a couple of pied flycatchers this one was really tame, went right up to, next to me and sort of checked me out. I guess maybe it had been a while since it, since it had seen a human um, in the forest. It might have been sort of wondering what I was doing. Um, I had quite a few different flycatchers come up. This was, I think this is, I think this might be a molting male because you can see on the back of it here, you can see the sort of darker black pluming to the adult male and perhaps it's now fading to this sort of grey which it turns to when it's about to uh, leave. I mean, most of the flycatchers, pied flycatchers, will now have fledged their young. So they become really difficult to see out in the forest. Um, they often spend time high up in the canopy. Um, uh, this one's been ringed, I've just noticed. Um, until late, sort of late July, they'll start turning up on the coast on migration. It's really early. Uh, kind of early along with the willow warblers they're quite an early migrant in the UK to leave um, usually it's young birds I don't think they've ever caught sort of they rarely catch adult birds uh, down on the coast um, but yeah it's not long until they'll be starting to think about leaving already to go to Africa uh, another bird I saw was red star uh, which I've been seeing quite a lot of this spring because they're quite up in my local patch but this around uh, with a couple of females and some young chicks, uh, all with that rusty red tail, which they flick around constantly. Um, quite eye-catching. Uh, and obviously in my garden, a lot of the pollinating plants are out now. I've had a few, uh, this is a fuchsia that's out. Uh, very large uh, buddleia, which will start attracting all the butterflies when it gets into flower. Um, this is wild honeysuckle or just a form of honeysuckle, I think, uh, which I think is what's attracting all the elephant hawk moths. Um, and this is, a, this is a bit of a project. This is a tobacco flower, which doesn't attract sort of any UK breeding species of moth. However, the, there is a migrant, migratory moth, which at the end of summer will start flying around, and they're spe specifically adapted to these tobacco flowers because they've got a super long proboscis, and that's the convolvius hawk moth. 
Uh, as you can see, it's a very big moth. I know it start turning up on the coast. It's down, uh, down on the southeast coast. I, I noticed on the map we'll probably start getting these turning up on their local moth patches. Um, and you can, as you can tell, it's got a very long proboscis for these tobacco flowers. Um, so it's a quite quite a, an interesting find. I've never seen one, but hopefully maybe I can attract one to the garden because they're not unknown in Gloucestershire. Uh, I think there's sort of annual records um, for convolvulus hawk moth. Um, so I can only hope that my tobacco flowers will uh, bring a couple to the garden. Um, well, and I think uh, uh, the challenge that you're setting yourself there, Greg. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been trying more pollinating plants in the garden convincing my parents um so we've got a lot of chive out as well and i noticed on our lavender this crab spider waiting for the the bees to uh an unlucky bee to check it out but i don't think it's blended in very well so i'm hoping that the bees will be able to spot this spider uh, crouching on the lavender um and that's probably about it for the week i think very much thank you but greg uh, as always uh, a fas fascinating tour not only of moths but of uh, orchids and uh, various other bits and pieces will go along danny asked the question uh, that oh, start off with a statement that she's seen a few orchid hybrids this week notice they always tend to be bigger in size than the non-hybrids and she wonders whether you or anybody else have observed the same uh, phenomena uh, yeah, they were quite big. Um, I think this year the orchids or the common spotted orchids I've noticed have been a bit smaller, um, possibly because of the drought conditions, because they can be quite sort of, in good years, they can be sort of quite long sort of towers, common spotted orchids, but this year they're not quite as big, um, whether that's because of the recent drought conditions, I'm not sure. I think they noticed that with fly orchids as well. Fly orchids this year haven't been particularly tall. Um, when yeah. they can be quite a long it's just more of a question, Greg, about the hybrids because, uh, well, so, so my background is evolutionary biology. So, like you mentioned, maybe it's just because the hybrids they're monopolising on resources, so they just tend to be bigger. But you know, sometimes you get a bit paranoid. Maybe I've looked at too many flowers recently. Mm. I'm just keen to see if anybody else in the group had ever noticed this, or when you next go out and maybe if you are looking for orchids, maybe see if this is actually a trend or not. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, look out for and for other people to to look out for. And uh, thank you very much indeed for all of that, Greg. Cheers to welcome Matt and to um, to invite Matt uh, to give uh, us a little talk. Uh, Matt was introduced to us by Danny. Danny, would you like to do a, a better introduction to Matt than I can whilst I set Matt's slides up for us, please? Oh, goodness, I can do my best. I mean, he, he was one of the uh, the groomsmen at my wedding and is a long time friend. But on a professional level, yes, Matt works um, with the wildlife uh, investigations crime unit um, with RSPB. Um, he's been a ornithologist for a great deal many many years um so if anybody's got any birdie questions i would recommend you point them in matt's direction um but obviously right now hopefully we're all very aware because it's a very pressing issue that our raptors in the uk are being persecuted and uh, matt has the very tough job working within a team of people dedicated to trying to bring justice um to all these crimes that are going on so i'm not really going to give much more away. I'm just going to hand over to Matt, if that's OK. Thank you very much, Danny. And over to you, Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, just check you can hear me first. Yes, we can. Excellent. So, yeah, as Danny said, I work in the RSPB's investigations team. Uh, we are a very small team in terms of you know, the RSPB as a whole being a, a very large nature charity. I think there's about 13 of us across uh, the four UK countries. And our main remit these days seems to be tackling raptor persecution. Um, although we do also get heavily involved with egg collecting, um, police massively rely on our knowledge of sort of behaviours of egg collectors and also identifying the eggs when they're eventually seized. And um, other things we tend to get involved with is protection of rare breeding birds that turn up. 
so I don't know if any of you have um, ever seen in the news or, or even in person and um, when flocks of bee eaters sometimes turn up um, in, in May, June in the UK, they will occasionally breed in sand quarries and, and, and cliff faces. Um, and we often put in 24 hour watches to make sure that people such as egg collectors don't disturb them and they have the best chance to, uh, to fledge. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be mainly talking about raptor persecution today because it is the, 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 the main area of our, our work these days and uh, you'll find out why very soon. Um, just quickly, um, apologize if you do find some of the pictures a little bit gory but it is unfortunately the reality of my day-to-day -day seeing images like this peregrine caught in this spring trap here um those spring traps have been banned since 1905 and even to to this year we still find them in use um by certain groups of people so i uh, just want to talk through some quick statistics uh, regarding rapt persecution um we have a database at the RSPB where we log and record every single um, case um, that occurs. Oh, the slides keep jumping ahead. I'm not sure why. Uh, Sorry. There we go. Um, so we, we, we keep this database, which uh, the police use as a resource and we, we use to um, um, publish uh, an annual bird crime report with, with the figures as well and on that database um, from 1971 to 2018 we've recorded over 3,000 confirmed incidents of people targeting birds of prey for, for various reasons. Uh, the map on the left hand side of the slide you can see at the minute shows every single one of those 3,142 cases um, at 1k or 10k level depending on what accuracy we had and that's just to demonstrate that this isn't a localized problem to certain areas generally it can occur absolutely anywhere in the UK uh, from you know it could be someone on your street who keeps pigeons who targets sparrowhawks and peregrines and um, it could be um, a farmer who is worried about kites taking his uh, take, killing his lambs um, in, in the Welsh valleys or um, it could be a, a gamekeeper or a, a pheasant rearer um, in, in a farm just outside the town you live in so it really can occur anywhere um, and it affects pretty much all species of bird of prey, although some are far more heavily affected than others. We've actually got over 22 species um, having been illegally killed on our database in, in sort of 40 years of recording, including some quite rare species. Um, we had a shot tawny owl in the, sorry, a shot snowy owl shot on Anglesey in the 70s. Um, quite famously, a red-footed falcon, which thousands of people twitched um, in Staffordshire and then later in Cambridgeshire when it moved, that was found shot um, right on the edge of, of some farmland uh, after thousands of people had seen it in, I think, 2015. Um, these, these numbers of confirmed incidents that we put on our database are made up of anything where we've got um, an X-ray showing that the bird has got shot in it, a toxicology report showing that it's ingested a banned or um, misused substance, um, or that we have a you know, video evidence of, of something actually happening um, uh, but we also do include reliable eyewitness accounts where someone is willing to make a statement to the police um, which is is very valid because a lot of these offences take place in areas that are very remote uh, often in our uplands and in the countryside where there's not many people and um, so actually getting the evidence and finding the bodies is it is part of the challenge and uh, we haven't actually done any um analysis on it yet but we are we are hoping at some point to actually look at what our detection rate is um because the the effort put in is very random and very, very sporadic for for finding these offenses uh, we tend to go where the intelligence sensors and then the rest is reports by members of the public who are out and about um but we're we're, we're you know guessing that we, we probably detect between um less than 10% and 1% of all confirmed persecution in the UK, um, which when I get onto some of the rarer species is potentially very significant to them at a population level. Uh, this wing tagged kite you can see on the photo there, that was illegally poisoned by a, uh, a substance carbofurin that's been banned since I think about 1999. Uh, and then there's a, another pole trap uh, on, a, on a, a very typical pole trap setup. 
Um, they are often set on tree stumps or high high fence posts along a, along a line of fences. I don't know if you've ever been out and about and um, you know seen buzzards, kestrels, kites, and things. When when they do land, they like to sit on a, a prominent perch, um, like corners of dry stone walls, fence posts, telegraph poles. So by putting the trap on top of a post like that, it's uh, increasing the chance of of catching a bird of prey. And they're very strong. They can they can actually sever the leg of a bird of prey. Once once it's caught, the bird's still alive. It'll thrash around, and the uh, the leg can actually uh, snap completely. So uh, we do have a few incidents on our database of birds where they've been discovered with only one leg. And avian pathologists uh, at various labs around the UK have been able to effectively prove that a spring trap was the only really likely cause of that injury. Uh, moving on. So who, who is killing our birds of prey and, and, what, and why are they doing it? Uh, this pie chart is probably one of the, the most well used um, charts our team has ever come up with. We have got a uh, on our database, we keep track of who is prosecuted for these incidents. And I mentioned 3000 odd incidents on the previous slide. For those incidents of someone deliberately targeting a bird of prey, only 180 people since 1990 have been prosecuted for those offences. So it's you know it's very difficult to once you've found the incident and proven that it's happening, then linking that to an individual and getting them into court is, is next to impossible and relies on a very specific set of circumstances to come together. But looking at this pie chart, you can see that 67.2% uh, of people who've been prosecuted in, in the last 20, uh, 30 years have been gamekeepers. If you combine that with the, the other game interests part of the chart as well, which is uh, farmers who are raising pheasants on their land for the local shoot, or even game farms, which are commercially exporting young pheasants and partridges out into, uh, into other shoots around the country. You're looking at almost three quarters of all offences um, prosecuted for killing birds of prey <clears throat> are to do with the game shooting industry, um, which obviously puts uh, us as a charity, the RSPB, who are um, very strictly neutral on the ethics of game shooting, whether it's right or wrong to kill a bird for fun and, and, and pay for that pleasure. We're completely neutral on that. But this this statistic does bring us into conflict with a lot of landowners and managers involved in the game shooting industry because we are perceived as blaming them for a loss of our birds of prey. But in some circumstances, we absolutely are, and we've got the stats to up. Uh, the map on the left hand side is a, a, a basic heat map. Um, and if you're familiar with the geography of the UK, you will notice that um, this, I'll just draw a line up it, this sort of spine here, that's the Pennines. And then you've got um, the Lammermuir Hills in Scotland there, um, an area of upland moorland, in southern Scotland there and then oops, slide skipped on again and then this big arc round here they're basically all predominantly grouse moor areas if you look on satellite maps you'll see the distinctive muir burn strips where the heather is periodically burnt off to produce new shoots which is what grouse feed red grouse feed on which is a uh, probably the it's called the king of sports uh, amongst game shooting people grouse grouse shooting um, and you'll notice that um, any black and red square is indicating over seven confirmed incidents in, in the 30 year period. And it, it just gives you an idea of where the concentration of these offences are taking place. So not only do we know um, from convictions who is being prosecuted for these offences, but also geographically, we know where the bulk of these incidents are taking place. And it's especially telling that a lot of these upland areas where grouse, more, uh, where grouse shooting takes place and specifically driven grouse shooting where often 20 or 30 beaters will walk in a long line for a kilometre or two pushing the grouse towards the shooters so that they can shoot as many as possible and um, it's that intensive element that drives people to um, seeing a, 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 a having a perceived need to remove practice raptors and other predators so there's a surplus of grouse but the, these areas are remote if you've ever been up into the peak district um or up into the up into the, the north pennines um on a, on, a, on a rainy day you can walk all day and not see another person and barely see a building and um, so the fact that we're still recording and detecting higher levels of persecution here than we are in sort of rural areas but that have um you know lots of small villages and hamlets and lots of people living in them it is very telling that there is is widespread systematic persecution going on in some of these these grouse small spots um and it's not just the rspb 
you know, sort of leveling the finger at certain aspects and elements of uh, driven game shooting. But uh, this little snip here is the title of a paper um, following up on 10 years worth of natural England satellite tagging of hen harriers, which basically determined that 72% of harriers are likely to disappear, suspected illegally killed over areas of driven grouse moors. Um, so it was very good to see that it wasn't just um, the ICPB as an NGO saying this, but it was actually a, a, a paper led by um, the, the government agency, um, Natural England. Next slide. So this is um, what we call the Wrapped Persecution Map Pub. This is a publicly available interactive map where you can uh, search around on different layers, a heat map, and then a, a sort of more detailed layer that lets you click on individual incidents and see if there's press releases or links attached to it. I'm just going to pop the link in the chat um, if you want to have a look. There is also a download option, so you can download currently data from 2007 to 2018, um, all confirmed persecution incidents, um, and, and play around with that at a sanitized 10 kilometer uh, level. And I know um, one of the main requests for data we tend to get in our team is for um, often undergrad and master's students wanting to basically have a, have a data set to play around with and see um, see if they can uh, frame any questions around it. And we're always willing to, to share our data with um, with, with students and, and and staff alike who want to want to look into it. Um, and again, this highlights the the key areas and some of the main black spots. Um, obviously, the, the, there are black spots which are away from upland areas and, and grouse moors. Um, there's a particular one in South Wales, um, where there's just one black square and nothing really else around it. And that was a poisoning over two years of about thirteen red kites and nine ravens and loads and loads of pheasant baits and it was actually on the Glanusk estate which is owned by the family who um, famously um, one of the members of the family was the nanny for both princes um, in the 90s um, and we've had numerous incidents involving uh, even Prince Harry being interviewed by police when two hen harriers were witnessed shot out of the sky over Sandringham estate in Norfolk in 2007 and um, Balmoral Estate in Scotland, the, the, the Queen's estate there, consistently only has one pair of eagles every single year, which is quite suspicious when you look at the eagle ecology in, in, in the wider area, that they only ever have the one when there's space for, for, for plenty more. So uh, uh, tackling wrapped persecution often isn't as simple as catching them at it and getting them prosecuted. It's convincing the authorities to get involved when there's quite a lot of buy-in from politicians and what would potentially be deemed as influential people um, and we regularly come up against uh, people like Paul Dacre who I think was owner of the Daily Mail um, or, or editor-in-chief and he himself is a very prominent grouse moor owner um, so politically and, and in the media it is often an uphill battle trying to uh, convey the scale and the problem of rat persecution. Next slide. So how do we catch people at it in our team? Um, so my role is Intel officer. So I, I'm not out in the field. Fortunately, I don't think I have the heart for this kind of job. I, I would I'd, I'd just be terrified, to be honest. Um, I mainly take the phone calls and the reports and um, I help build things like the map hub and um, supply data when it's requested and um, yeah, I do a lot on protecting our sources as well, because a lot, a lot of people who tend to report wrapped persecution, they're often quite close to the people doing it. Um, so we've had gamekeepers' wives ringing us up um, and they're just fed up of what they know that their husband's up to and they want to tell us everything, but they can't have it come back to them. They might know something that only they would know. And if we tipped off the police about it and the police did a, took, did a warrant and went exactly to the spot this gamekeeper's wife had mentioned, the gamekeeper would know instantly who had told us. So we do a lot of um, source protection and you know, GDPR comes into this, making sure we have permission to even keep people's names when they've reported things to us. Um, and it can be quite tricky being told some very horrific things and then actually being able to do very little with it to protect the source. Um, but these images here show, um, well, my colleague in the top left in Cyprus, um, we, we do do some international work because obviously the UK has overseas territories and the RSPB helps out there. And we have a, a large base on Cyprus where 
um, the local mafia, uh, politicians, police, everyone is quite happy for people to be trapping birds, small birds, black capped robins, and then free, selling them illegally in restaurants as food, uh, and Bella Puglia. Um, so we occasionally go there, but this is just a demonstration of one of our field officers in camo, probably about 400 metres away from anything going on, but in camo with a camera hiding in a bush, and that tends to be one of our main ways of trying to catch people committing crimes out in the countryside. It's uh, actual directed surveillance, um, which is technically unlawful without landowner permission. Um, but provided we follow strict criteria, and um, we've had very few, at least in England, where a judge in court has decided that it was unlawful and therefore couldn't be used as evidence. Most of the time they accept it's unlawful, but except it was justified on the basis of what we've subsequently recorded and that we've uh, mitigated the risks because uh, you can't just go around recording people uh, going about their daily lives um, but if you follow in certain procedures and confident they're committing a crime then um, you can within reason. Uh, this photo on the right hand top right hand side uh, was from I think 2017 and um, the gentleman walking towards the police officers uh, had been witnessed about two hours earlier by one of our one of our field workers shooting two shorty adals. We didn't actually manage to film that, but we did film him stamping them into the ground, and the police responded instantly. Um, they did turn up in the valley with their sirens blaring, whilst this guy was still wandering around with his gun. So he uh, he was a bit concerned already, and he actually tried running, and he he, he ran off for about thirty minutes before realising he just wasn't going to get away. Um, so um, you know there was there was a genuine sort of cop chase taking place on the on the North Yorkshire Moors a couple of years ago. He received, I think, £800 fine per bird in court. Um, and the estate that he worked on um, is still a member of various Moorland associations that jumped into the defence of it. Um, so there were, politically, there were no repercussions. Financially, the estate got off scot-free. This guy got a £1,600 fine and it didn't really change anything, um, despite him being convicted for killing two birds of prey. Um, so it's very difficult, even once we've caught someone, to get meaningful action that actually changes anything. And um, we're discovering more and more that actually putting this video out in, in the public domain and making the public aware is probably our biggest win, rather than in the courts and um, particularly with Westminster government um, lobbying for change. We're, we're making very little ground. So public, public opinion is where we seem to be making our gains at the minute, and that will hopefully shift the tide in Westminster eventually. Um, this guy in the bottom left hand corner, uh, we filmed him setting um, pole traps on uh, Mossdale estate owned by um, Fitzwilliam family who um, are best friends with the royals. Uh, again, he, I think, I think he was given a caution. Um, North Yorkshire Police did apologise for issuing a caution because the, technically they should have prosecuted him, um, but they made a mistake on the day and just let him off with a caution, despite him setting three traps over about six days. Um, on open moorland, just a, a, a spring-loaded trap on a fence post, so any bird of prey that would have landed on it would have, would have had its legs crushed. And we actually sent off two of the traps for DNA analysis and discovered that um, one of them had kestrel DNA on it and another unknown falcon ID uh, species on it, which was probably Merlin. Um, and like, Merlins and kestrels are no threat to grouse at all, but they were still happy to catch them as bycatch whilst targeting um, other birds of prey that were threats like hen harriers and buzzards. And the guy on the right, um, we filmed uh, accessing his hidden illegal pesticide store uh, that included two substances commonly used to target birds of prey. Um, he was he never went to court for any of the pesticide issues because um, the, the video wasn't good enough to identify him. Um, but the police felt it was good enough to remove his firearms license, which he appealed and won. So he got his firearm back. So he effectively got off scot-free for storing, I think, three banned pesticides in the middle of a plantation two miles from the nearest road, which is just shocking because you, you don't have to be you know up to speed with rat persecution or, or the law to know that that's highly suspicious and just very very odd and um, so yeah as you can gather from this we, we set we set a lot of remote cameras as well so rather than direct phone photos or someone sat there watching and um, we do we do set remote cameras leave them running for a week or two and hope we catch something um and yeah, just a quick note on what we're doing via Westminster. We are currently lobbying for vicarious liability. So if anyone 
is convicted of killing birds of prey um if vicarious liability was in place in england and, and it is in scotland and um, then the landowner would then have to prove that they had taken measures to make sure that they were actively stopping their staff from 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 doing this uh, and and if not it they, they could end up in court themselves and um, so that would be a, a very good way of putting the onus of that persecution on the landowners um which which would be step forward and we're also asking for licensing of driven grouse moors and um, currently if you own a bit of moorland and you want to have um you know 25 shoot days on it where people come up and and, and, and shoot grouse um and you can use medicated grit you can kill tons of um native mammals with with next to no paperwork at all there's there's no licensing control at all um so we'd like to see them licensed and then um if offenses are discovered linked to the estate uh licenses could be removed and that would impact them financially which would hopefully have some effect and uh, i think i best wrap up there because i've probably gone over um so any questions thank you bruce for that um people are commenting that that's some really valuable work that you're doing uh, just wait to see if there's any questions come through eleanor you want to ask something yes please um i was just wondering is egg, egg persecution still quite prevalent as well so egg collecting was a massive problem well right from when the law changed in 1982 to make it illegal to to take them up till about probably the early 2000s and um, we were involved in a lot of big cases back then where judges were frustrated that they couldn't do anything other than apply quite mediocre fines and it got to the point where actually um legisl legislation was changed so that egg collectors could receive jail time and I think we've had about 12 egg collectors go to prison about 25 times between them um, because they come out of prison, they collect more eggs and they go back in again. And that has cut it right down to a very core minority of people. Um, so yeah. we've gone from sort of probably 15 cases in court a year to one every two or three years and much fewer reports. Um, so it has, it's massively dropped off and it's not the resource drain it used to be on our team and also on um you know nesting birds um but, yeah. but it, it, is, it is still out there um but just yeah. not at the same level it's just quite interesting that there's such disparate penalties between egg collecting and actually shooting or trapping a raptor but yep and i suspect yeah. a lot of that comes down to <laughs> egg collectors not having uh, any sort of politically motivated bodies supporting them yeah um, okay yeah. fair enough okay thank you thank Alan. you thank you matt and we'll move on if we we may and uh, the next thing that we're to, to look at is our video of the week with the current pandemic confining us to our homes it urges us to look around at what we have in close proximity the farms and woodlands around this estate are teeming with wildlife but in this little courtyard a certain pair of goldfinch decided to call this acer their home. These little architects were travelling to nearby farmland crowded with sheep and stripping the scratch posts of wool. Weaving this wool with downy feathers and twigs, it creates the perfect insulated nest for their precious offspring. Content with her cosy creation, she starts to lay her eggs, each one a day apart. And just like that, she is sitting, incubating, continuing to lay the remaining eggs. There is a long fortnight ahead for this goldfinch, protecting her young through whatever is thrown her way. But she is not alone. The male is never too far away. He's back and forth, keeping her stomach full right until new life starts to emerge. It isn't long before there are six hungry mouths to feed. These chicks grow at an extraordinary rate. Just two weeks later, they are fully feathered and almost ready to take on the world. With a bit of reassurance from the unlooking parents, it encourages the chicks to trust their wings and before you know it, the chicks are now fledglings. 
and the parents have done it. They have achieved nature's gold. Connecting with nature is essential for our well-being and it must continue long after lockdown. And now we move uh, from the world of video into the world of words. And I welcome Ursula uh, to our little gathering and uh, pass over to Ursula for the next five minutes or so. Thank you, Philip, for the introduction and thank you for welcome me, welcoming me into your, your wonderful group. I am very much an, an amateur naturalist but think of myself as a professional writer. So it's wonderful to be in the presence of so many experts and to share in your, your amazing insights and knowledge. So we've called this section Eco Words, and that's, that's quite deliberate. There is a section of literary and creative writing activity called Eco Poetics, um, which can be quite abstract, quite philosophical, and also quite political. So we deliberately wanted to broaden that out and talk about eco words, uh, which is much more than a particular kind of poetry. And the example that um, I'm bringing in here and the kind of broad definition that I thought was helpful was this one that I've put on screen, which is a multidisciplinary approach that includes thinking and writing on poetics, science and theory. And that's the kind of space I'd like to position this slot into and when i talk about poetics i don't mean narrowly poetry but maybe more in the way that aristotle talked about poetics which is literature more generally and any act of narrative storytelling or textual activity so i wanted to give two brief examples of my my practice both as a critic or as a reader and also as a, a practitioner so first of all i wanted to share with you a little excerpt from Ali Smith's recent novel called Spring and you can see a lovely David Hockney um, picture on the front cover. I think I can make out some cow parsley and maybe also some candles of perhaps a pink horse chestnut down the track there but maybe you will have better luck at identifying more of those plant species but I think the cover is, is quite deliberate. It really wants to position the novel as something that puts us in dialogue with the natural world. And I just want to read a brief excerpt to you. Uh, does anybody know this novel? Anyone raise a hand if they already know it? It was published quite recently. So maybe maybe you'll want to give it a read after hearing this, this bit. So I'll read a short excerpt. The air lifts. It's the scent of commencement, initiation, threshold. The air lets you know quite ceremonially that something has changed. Primroses deep in the ivy throw wide the arms of their leaves. Colour slashes across the everyday. The deep blue of grape hyacinths, the bright yellows in waves catching the eyes of the people on trains. Birds visit the leafless trees, but not leafless like in winter. Now the branches stiffen, the ends of the twigs glow like low burning candles. Then the rain and the first sign of the branch splitting open to blossom on the old tree. The light inside visible in the wood, you can see it even at night under the street lamps. Now, I not only find that really beautiful and pleasurable, just as a, a lovely description of spring, but also the conceit of this novel is that we actually realise we are really reading a notebook which is written by a young woman who is an asylum seeker. And as soon as we realise that, then that kind of description of an English spring becomes much more complex and interesting. And when our character is perceiving, for example, that the primroses throw wide the arms of their leaves, that sense of welcome and the environment welcoming a stranger seems to be much, much more rich and resonant. So obviously there'd be a lot more that we could do with that if we wanted to progress that reading. But I just wanted to give an example of how attention to representations of the natural world in text can open up different perspectives and different ways of engaging with it. So just finally, the next thing I wanted to share with you 
was a little bit of my own practice in progress. Um, so I think of myself as a nature poet. Uh, my poetry doesn't happen instantly, so it's not like I could go for a walk today and have a finished poem about it tomorrow. So it works more like an archaeology of memory, and often it's plants and my engagement with plants growing in natural places that triggers these things. So I have a poem in progress, and as the slide suggests, it's called Ramsons and Celandines. So it was really the scent of the wild garlic um, and its association with celandine plants um, in a place in my memory. And it was smelling that scent again that took me back to something that happened many, many years ago. Um, and I started trying to represent that layering and the way that memory and identity interact with the natural world. So I'll, I'll read it out to you. It works in a spatial way as well, but just for now, I'll, I'll do the, the verbal and with you. Ramsons and celandine. Walk through woods. You were never finished. Legs ached with memory, living, not yet. Cool, damp, seeping into spirit paths we can no longer take. Flooded badger set, a power tool, dogs racing, splashing, a small child going after falling in. We line the river bank to watch. Erosion, subsidence, deep inertia, pulling noise into itself, compressing days into silence, eating, resting, considering presence. Curtains of dead climbers, drone and churn, alarm, bouncing sky sound, spring seedlings from the mud. The earth is still, blossom clouds becomes grey wool. It makes no sound. Your silence is strong, the way trees grow. So that was the poem in, in progress, and maybe at some point I'll circulate the finished text, but that's just one example of my practice and how I hope you can see the natural world is um, really fundamental to my inspiration and the way that I work as a poet. So uh, thank you for indulging that little poetic interlude, and I'm very happy for any, any questions or reflections, um, or Philip might want to, to move on. Well, well, I will move on with the slides, but that will give an opportunity for anybody to raise any uh, comments that they would like to on uh, what was an excellent uh, addition to our program. Thank you, Ursula. I just uh, let anybody add something into the chat if they wish or speak whilst I uh, change the slides over. And I see that, uh, now I'll come back to that in a second when I've done the slide bit. Third attempt, I might get it right. So Ursula, I see that people are thanking you for that contribution and for the, the difference that it brings to our reflections on the natural world and how it changes pace and invites us, I think, personally to slow down a little in terms of our exploration of the natural world and to be more contemplative about what we see and what we experience. So thank you very much. And we move on to Jamie. Hello, welcome. Um, so, just checking the slides are working. That looks fine. Um, so, 
sort of extending what I did last week and trying to kind of show you what you can do with a ver with a relatively affordable camera. Now, I, I'm promised I'm not sponsored by Olympus. I bought this camera for the purposes of underwater photography. Um, I only found out last week that it's got very, very good macro settings. Um, so I have taken this camera swimming and photographed seals and jellyfish and comb jellies off the coast of Wales. But I can't go to the coast of Wales right now. So I've been in my garden trying to give you examples of what we can get close to home. Now, um, I got unhealthily obsessed with local red tailed bumblebees, um, and you can see a short video of them on the Sea Nature Facebook page. I put it up yesterday. Um, and getting sharp photos of them in dark conditions, um, and mostly they're black too, has been an amusing challenge. But I got some shots which were kind of sharp in the end, and some of these are here. So this is a tree bumblebee. Um, they've got a nest in the eaves of our roof. So this one's nest is only eight meters up directly above these flowers. And as you can see, it's sticking out its tongue ready to land. And it has landed beautiful fluffy things. Um, these shots have been edited a little bit, but they're pretty much straight off the camera. It does a very good job. Um, and now we've got the red tailed bumblebees. Now they're relatively common, but um, I just think they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, very cute little things with their bright red bums. And you can see this one is doing a very good, if we go back one slide, you can see this one, we're on slide 17. It seems to be running through. It's got big, full pollen sack on its legs. So it's doing a very, very good job of raiding um, the lupins in my garden. Um, just lovely, lovely things. I'm completely obsessed. We own, you can see a mite on this one on slide 17. Um, so something is clinging to it and infesting it. Um, and uh, as we know, varroa mites are some of the parasites that cause major problems to honeybees. I'm not sure what this mite is, but certainly this bee is not having a you know not having an effortless time but they're wonderful wonderful animals and i got dangerously obsessed with them and this is at dusk with the light shining off some paint in the garden and lots of hopefully unusual images now next i'm talking a little bit about macro photography and you're welcome to message me by email or on the facebook group if you have any questions about any of this so this is a beetle on the garden chair and it's probably six millimeters long really really small lovely thing with these blue tones on the front of its abdomen and the basics of macro photography remain the same whether whatever camera you're using so problems include camera shake the depth of focus correct exposure and getting close enough so the thing doesn't doesn't fly away now, these, this beetle was very, very patient, but I'm going to explain a few of these issues now. Now, camera shake is a major issue. It can be very hard to get a tripod close enough to an insect without it flying away. Stabilisation helps um, on the camera, and it also helps not to overdo the coffee before or during taking photos. Um, but decent light levels are often important if you can't get a tripod, just to make sure those images are sharp. Next problem is depth of focus. Now, just, um, yeah, we're still on the beetle, good. The front, this is actually three images combined. Um, thank you for your comments, Steve. Um, so this is three images combined, and you can see that the actual front to back sharpness of each of these images was probably well under one millimeter. So it's very, very hard to get enough of the subject in focus and secondly, um, because you're moving forwards and backwards, it's very hard to get the right bit of focus. Now, taking several shots can help, but um, focus stacking, which you can do in a wide range of pieces of software, including in camera and including in Photoshop elements, can be very, very useful. So what I've done here is I've taken many shots. Most of them were useless, but I've, I've chosen three one with focus on the feet, one with focus on the eyes, and one with focus on the back of the thorax. I've 
taken them into a piece of software, I've aligned them per automatically, and then I've stacked them. So we've ended up with something with just about enough focus from sort of the front of the feet to the front of, of the abdomen. Any more would be nice, but I just couldn't get it. So this is a wide, this is a common technique, which we can use very effectively. Again, the slides are moving for some reason. So back to this fly. Now the fly on slide 20, um, I couldn't um, focus stack this because the images certain just didn't correspond to each other. If I move a lot or if the fly scratches its face, you just can't do anything about it. And I couldn't get in front of the fly because it would move away. I have to try that. But you can see a single image can show very, very nicely, in this case, the eye structure of the fly. Now, I took about 10 images and this is the best one. So you really can have a lovely time messing around with the macro facility on, on these cameras. Um, now, I was sort of brought up using a macro lens and a DSLR, but this is a far cheaper effect and actually focuses much closer than the expensive gear. Um, this is pretty much the end of my talk. I was messing around with some water droplets and things like that. The great thing about water droplets and insects is they don't fly away, um, or, but um, you can have a lot of fun with the insects. And remember, this is a camera which is frankly meant for messing around underwater. Um, as I said, I promise I'm not sponsored, but there really, really are only about two cheap waterproof cameras available, which is how I got it in the first place. Um, I will continue messing around with the local insects and the dragonflies, um, and I will do something similar, maybe a little bit more technical, next week. Um, so does anyone have any questions? If you want to put them on the chat page, and if you want to drop me an email, I'll put my email address up now. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, fascinating as always, and I uh, see some of the comments are about um, the incredible detail that one gets with these And I see a question uh, from Eleanor, which is about the the software that you've used. Uh, perhaps, uh, can you just say what that software was very quickly? Yeah, no problem. I was using Photoshop, but Photoshop Elements does it absolutely fine. And actually, you can do it in camera. Um, so I could have, um, I could have done it in camera. Um, message from Hugh, I was actually using the little Olympus um, compact camera that you can get for about £130 on eBay. It's got a very good macro setting. Um, uh, although previously I would be using macro lenses, but I think the whole point is, of this is to show what you can do relatively cheaply. Um, so I'm going to put all the words that I've just spoken up on fa the Facebook page, and you've got my email address here. So if anyone has got any other questions, um, please do say. But I'm happy to stay online for a bit if you if you've got any other questions. Okay, thank you very much. We should move on, and uh, our last last contributor for today is Rob. Right. So good morning, everybody. So the news story I picked out this week is, as you can see, urban foxes evolve in schools like dogs. This is actually based on some research done at the University of Glasgow and with the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, where they've compared the schools of foxes from urban environments and those in rural environments and found that the ones in urban environments, they now have broader schools and shorter schools and they think that this is related to the fact that they're feeding off scraps um, from around our houses. So it's an adaptation to the kind of food sources. And the other thing they found was that they have smaller um, cranial capacity, which is something we see in domestication. So one of the suggestions of the authors is that maybe this is, you know, urban foxes on the road towards become a domesticated animal at some point in time. So I thought that was you know, a very fascinating article on how you know, our environment is actually affecting the animals that live in it. So the next thing is an app. It's actually an app you have to pay for called Warbler, but it recognizes British bird songs. So I'm not very good on British birds. I freely admit it. And so for me, I often hear birds, but I don't see them. And so having an app like Warbler 
allows me to record what I've heard and then it tells me you know the likelihood of what bird it actually was singing at that particular moment in time and this is all based on using um, AI um, technology and it's also I thought something interesting to mention because it's something that here at Salford we have a lot of people who are acoustic experts can I get back to the slide yeah so I could see a lot of potential for us doing things like this with our acoustics department and then finally as a resource this is people often ask me how I find things out and Philip knows I like digging around the internet and I'm quite obsessed with citations and one of the best places to see citations in the UK is in the Shetlands and there's a Facebook group an open one so you don't have to be on Facebook to access this group and this is the link to it here it's Orca sightings in the Shetlands and I look at this group several times every week and so recently they've had humpback whales not just orcas dolphins um, quite a lot of the people who put um, film and photos are wildlife professionals or film professionals so there's some really outstanding photography and filming and of course I use it for a planning a future trip to the Shetlands to actually see all these animals because people are actually noting all the locations of where all their sightings are so it's just an alternative way of finding out about you know the wildlife around us in ways that people might not normally think about and I think I'll stop there thank you very much Rob as always a fascinating eclectic mixture of things that we might have missed and that brings it up to date with some current thought and provides us with some resources to take our own interest forward. Uh, we asked at the beginning uh, what this was and uh, a number of you uh, knew and uh, wrote in the, uh, the chat. Um, I think we need to make these a little bit harder in the future uh, as to what uh, these would be a little more challenging perhaps for some people. And that brings me to uh, think about next week. Uh, uh, we will meet next Wednesday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Our guest will be David O'Brien, who works for Scottish Natural Heritage. And I look forward to meeting you at uh, that time. And uh, we've mentioned that there is a Facebook page and uh, there's a link to that Facebook page which has got recordings from uh, these events and uh, other bits and pieces on and I'd just like to thank our contributors Greg, Ollie, Ursula, Jamie and Rob today and they, uh, particularly to thank Matt who gave up his time to join us and give us a fascinating insight into the work of the RSPB and uh, the prosecution of um, Raptor uh, Crimes. Thanks to Danny for putting together today's programme and uh, thank you all for joining us, joining me today.